Welcome to today's financial report-up broker bootcamp. As you might have seen, we've done a few of these events so far, and we'll be doing a couple more over the summer. And these are just, rather than product-based topics, they're the topics about other things that affect mortgage brokers and sort of your businesses and things surrounding them. So we did a session on lead generation. This session it is about uh, broker mental health and mental health in the industry more broadly. And very excitingly for this session, we have got probably the best possible people to talk about that because we have the mortgage industry mental health charter. So we have co-founder Martin Reynolds from Simply Blizz. We've got Sam Rental, who's an HR professional from TSB, who are one of the signatories of the charter. And very excitingly, we've got Clark Carlisle, who's a professional footballer and is now a mental health advocate, who's going to be giving us a different perspective on mental health and um, talking about his experiences. So it's going to be a really interesting session. We've got really three really good speakers with three different perspectives on it and i'm really looking forward to this so a little bit of there's our speakers again i probably should have clicked next slide there um a little bit of housekeeping please keep your mics and cameras switched off just so that we don't interrupt the speakers if you do have questions if you hover your mouse over the bottom of the screen there's a chat box please feel free to pop them in there and if we get towards the end and we've got some questions i'm sure martin can run through those or i can run through those at the end if we've got some time and um, yeah, so we'll get to the Q and A's at the end of the session. But otherwise, I'm going to turn my mic off now and get out of the way and hand over to our speakers. Thank you very much, Amy, and welcome to everybody. Um, really good uh, to see you all, and uh, really excited about this session because the, there's a lot of work goes into this, and uh, it, it's good to talk about it. it. It's good to get people's views on it, and as Amy says be great to get questions. I'll leave Amy to do the technology bit and let us know what the questions are, rather than me probably uh, cancelling the whole session and turning everybody off. Um, but yeah, and uh, great that Sam and uh, Clark are here as well. So as we said, we, we do a survey every year and we, we're really pleased that we get more and more numbers every year and we, we ask very similar questions so that we can understand trends. And we, we're 30% up on, on the number of people that responded uh, this year, which then makes the uh, actual feedback quite interesting because it, it, it's always that balance of are we getting uh, new opinions which can skew maybe some of the figures or is it an actual trend that we're now seeing? So we'll jump into that and I'll ask a few questions to everybody and, and look at where we are and uh, how we're doing on that. But it, it'll be good to look at some of the stats and then just get a feedback from Sam and Clark as to where we think we are. So some of the things that it, uh, impacting mental health. So one of the questions that, that we talk about um, is very much a, about your overall level of professional contentment, I think the question is. Um, and what we're seeing is that that's declined quite a bit over the last 12 months. So people who are pretty disillusioned and considering the options has jumped from 15 to 19%. So nearly one fifth of the respondents are looking at, do we want to stay in the industry? Um, and then 37% are just moderately happy. So you're looking at over 50% of people actually aren't happy with, with what's happening. So Sam, what, what do you think that could be? And what, what sort of help can we do? I think it's a, it's a, difficult, it's a difficult gig right now. Um, and what we're really cognizant of is acknowledging that reality for our colleagues. Um, and that tone set at the top. So talk, speak to the current experience of our colleagues and, and making sure that our leadership teams and our managers are aware of the challenges that our colleagues are facing. So we're not sort of pushing a pipe dream. It's really let's talk about those hard realities of what we're facing, um, external factors and internal factors, as well as in our own personal lives. But what we're really keen to do in TSB is celebrate those successes. Yes, it is really hard. And you might not have gotten exactly where you'd like to be and workloads are stressful. But let's take the time as teams to talk about, well, what's gone really well? Um, we have a platform here in TSB where we can send um, social recognition to one another. We've also devolved a, a sort of moderate budget pot where each individual can give points to each other to celebrate when, when has someone been there for you where you can lean on them. Um, and also managers can signify that and, and sort of boost recognitions and really sort of do a big show and tell, celebrate when that's gone really well. And I think that that's really important. Um, when things are tough, don't, don't take the, um, don't walk by those moments that matter where colleagues have been there to lean on each other. Um, and I think that that is really important. Okay, thank you. Clark, views from yourself? 
Yeah, well, you know what, what what Sam's articulated there is very important. You have to understand what's happening in the workplace. Um, one one of the the difficulties with understanding professional contentment is that we focus solely on the workplace when actually professional and personal are inextricably linked. So it's what we have to assess and be cognizant of, like Sam said, is the, the changing and conflicting values between your work persona and your personal persona. And what we see from the, the, the data is that even though only 20% of people value a fulfilling professional career, over 60% of people are overworking in a typical week so, you know, there's a direct conflict between conflict between the personal and the professional. Um, and again, you have to try and understand that. So even though only 20 percent value a fulfilling professional career, there are over 24 percent and sorry, not over 46 percent who value financial independence. So you see there's a personal and professional payoff that people are having to go through and they have to manage the disparity between that. Um, you know, my, my personal opinion on that is what we have to do is prioritise our core values. So if you feel like 26% of the respondees do, that hobbies are, are, are a significant value in your life, then prioritizing them in your schedule will make you feel like you are fulfilling your personal values. Mm -hmm. And that can be a payoff against the professional application. It doesn't have to be, I'm taking three days out a week for this. It can be, I've put an hour in my diary, I've diarized it, and that is for me to do some coloring in that that's for me to go mountain biking the time slots irrelevant it's the fact that you've prioritized it over other commitments and that can give you the sense of satisfaction in the conflict between professional and personal contentment yeah no, I agree. Nothing. sorry sam sorry mike no it's just i uh, just to add to um to that point um what what we do within TSB, so our, our whole approach to our performance model, if you like, starts in well-being. So we encourage our managers to talk to our colleagues about the four R's of well-being, um, and that's readiness, rest, revitalization, and recovery. So actually, in those one-to-one -one conversations, having an understanding of, for me, I cannot be well at work unless I am a fully um, rounded well-being view. So where do I get that revitalization? So making time for things like your hobbies or having a walk, it's not just about getting a good night's sleep. You'll still feel burnt out. It's not just about, you know, making sure you get daylight in your eyes. What's well, going to fill your cup up so that when you face the next working day, um, you are actually revitalized and ready and rested to perform at your best. Yeah, and I think I think you're right. One of the questions was about that work life balance and 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 have we got it and again sometimes you have to try and interpret and read between the lines so greatly improved was only four percent compared to 17 percent in 2023 but that could be because people had actually achieved the work-life balance so therefore there wasn't as much to to improve on that but the interesting bit is greatly worsened or somewhat worsened had had actually got higher so i think it could be that as with all things, there's a split. There's some people who've actually worked that out and the, and there's others that, that sort of haven't. So it's that quick wins, which I think you, you mentioned there, Clark. And I think maybe identifying what it is that makes you happy. And, and one of the questions is about that, um, around that health and well-being and away from it, what, what makes people connected to health and well-being? And it was quite interesting although it shouldn't be surprising, that 67% of people said a happy relationship with their partner makes them feel better. Um, but it's back to that prioritising, isn't it? How do you prioritise that if you're working really late all the time that you make the time for your partners? And, you know, fitness and diet was quite high. Financial independence were high. So there was nothing that was was massively a surprise, but it's back to that point of... How do we get that to work? So was there anything in there, Clark, that surprised you in, in the reasons people are happy? 
Well, the, the, the specific reasons that come out in the data, I believe, should be irrelevant to us as a top line because we've got 7 billion people on the planet and they're going to have 7 billion different lists of priorities. The, the, the core aspect of this is every individual being aware of what their values are. If you don't know what your values are, then you can live life on autopilot and not be fulfilling those values and not know why you're feeling discontent. Mm. So I think what this question uh, should bring to to you know our colleagues and employees attention is i need to understand my values what are my priorities and when i know that that's when i can start to prioritize my values and what i feel should be significant in my life and like i said in the first response it doesn't have to be that it's a 50 50 balance work and personal life all it has to be is that you have established that this is important to me and I'm going to set specific time aside for it each week. And when you fulfill that that diary appointment, that's when you start to feel that, that contentment in your personal life. So I, I don't think we should focus specifically on what it is. We should focus on getting the message out that we as individuals need to know what it is that we want to fulfill. And then we can fit that into our work life schedule. Yeah, and, and some from that is there a bit around that that if you start doing that, there's is there a guilt complex within there as well? One that maybe you're not doing it with the partner, but also if you then put something in during the day, do you feel the guilt that you should be working, or or the rest of your team can see that you've disappeared? So do you feel guilt that you're not there? How do we get over that? I suppose. Yeah. And that, that's a really interesting one, Martin. It's something that um, we often debate, but actually um, behaviour drives behaviour. So yes, we all feel guilty. Um, even in times when you're unwell, especially in a hybrid working environment, there's a drive for people to log on. Oh, well, I can just log on and do a bit. But we need to normalise as colleagues, managers, leaders, and people in the society that we're not going to do that. And we will make time. And the more people that schedule their lunch and finish on time and make time and popping out for a walk, you know, advertise the things you're doing, the time you're taking for yourself and make it OK. The more you do it and you're brave and you deal with that internal guilt, the more you give permission for other colleagues to model that behaviour. Um, and that's where we want to get to. So it's, it's being brave, doing it and then knowing that you're, you're not just doing it for yourself. Let that assuage your guilt. You're, you're setting the right behaviour. Mm -hmm. And if I can add to that, please, yeah, Martin, sure. you know, just like Sam said, the senior leadership team evidencing that that behaviour is acceptable is of fundamental importance. Um, to give a footballing analogy, I don't know if many people on, on, the, on the call are aware of Sam Allardyce. You know, Sam Allardyce is a manager. He played long ball football. If I was part of his team, I wouldn't play the lovely Pep Guardiola passing football, not because I don't value it, but because I know Sam doesn't value it. And we mimic the behaviours and the standards that are set at the highest possible level within our teams. And that, again, can cause personal and professional conflict. So senior leadership members evidencing that personal time, that diarising it, prioritising it is part of our work culture and our work environment is of fundamental importance to addressing this notion of professional contentment. As a West Brom fan, Clark, I've had to experience Sam's football. So, yeah, thank you for bringing that on. I know, I know some great therapists, Martin. <laughs> um but but that's interesting about you know, we keep talking about this taking control of, of of your own destiny, I suppose, and making your own happiness. And and there was one of the questions that was around stress and what was causing stress for the last 12 months. But what was clear that a third of it was the economic environment, product withdrawals with high client demand. So quite a lot of this was outside of the control of an advisor. So again, how do you do that? Can you just how do you focus on the bits I can control versus the bits I can't, but the bits you can't like the economy. And, you know, we had the, the Liz Trust but budget, which just made everybody work so hard last year that how do you manage that as a control mechanism? 
Clark, maybe? Uh, yeah, I'll come to this. Um, my input in this, uh, and you have to accept mine uh, with a pinch of salt because I'm removed from your sector and the mm -hmm. daily work environment. So I can only speak to professional uh, personal experience. And my personal experience is that that's an inside job. That 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 is being aware of your emotional responses uh, and how you um, manage process and then respond in given situations. Mm -hmm. And in my experience, that acknowledgement of I can only control my controllables mm -hmm. and that's where my responsibility lies, that that caused a paradigm shift in my approach to life. Mm -hmm me far more relaxed and and when you really do take that on and embrace it you'll be amazed at the butterfly effect of how it affects all parts of your life and to, to evidence that I'll tell you now I am such a relaxed driver I'm such a relaxed driver as a young man I was erratic where I was going was the most important journey in the world but now when I understand the context that other people have places to go I can only control where I am and and uh, and how I manage my car, and I'll get there when I get there, mm. and when I accept that, it just it just really relaxes me, you know, and it, it it affords me the opportunity to show other drivers compassion on the road, so it changes my whole emotional interaction on an intrapersonal level when I accept that I can only control my controllables. So that personal development, I think, will feed into this mm -hmm. acceptance of this the high stress levels of this work environment. And I, I suppose, Sam, taking that forward within ourselves, and, and we know it's great now that we've got not just brokers filling out this survey, but we know that predominantly it's still brokers. And sometimes they can feel like they're sat in the middle. So lenders doing product withdrawals may be quick. They then having to work, rearrange their diary to ring lots of customers who who some customers then think it's a it's a heavy sales technique going, no, I need an answer in the next 30 minutes, otherwise it's rates gone. And basically the broker sometimes is sat there in the morning going, I have no control over my day. Or I think I have until I get the emails telling me something else. And I suppose it's that bit, isn't it? Is how how can a a, a broker or how can a lender help them with those controllables? I think um, in these circumstances, and it's and to matter Clark's point, there are other there are other circumstances you find in life where you're between pillar and post, whether that's working kids or um, other work stresses, other stakeholders. So just remember that you're internalizing that stress. So, what? Take a moment and self reflect. We do a lot of promotion around the stress curve in TSB. So are you feeling energised by that level of stress or are you erring into burnout? And if you start to err into burnout, speak up. Share best practice. There's no point in an HR professional coming and telling, you know, our brokers or any other um, SME within any of our, any of our functions, um, local practices and how to manage that workload. So have a safe space conversation amongst teams. Share best practice. What works for you? Um, how does how do you stack your day? Um, is it is it taking a moment halfway through the day to say, well, how am I feeling? Looking at the stress curve and then opening up. Sometimes acknowledging the reality of I'm starting to feel a bit overwhelmed here. I want to just take five minutes to talk through everything that I need to get through in the day. Really helps. So who are your allies that you have that you're going to pick up the phone to, um, and pick up the phone. You know, share that problem, have a conversation. Even just talking aloud can help you make sense of the day. Um, and if you're taking on too much, speak up. And I suppose that's great support network. Um, I'll come back to some other bits of survey, but I suppose the one bit that it does for me in this and there's other initiatives in the industry is it's great in the corporate world, a big, a big size lender, a big distributor where we've got lots of staff and we can have somebody specifically doing this and, 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 and working and helping. If we look at a small brokerage with maybe three advisors in there and, and two admin people, they're all busy doing that. They don't have a, a head of HR, a head of legal, or, or you know, a head of it's how do we help those type of firms who 
don't have that resource, don't have the time to go and research that resource in some instances, how do we get this sort of information and this sort of help and guidance across to them? Uh, you, you, oh, sorry, Sam. After you, Clark. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you raise a really pertinent and important point there, Martin, especially in this sector, because the, the vast majority uh, of brokers, et cetera, you know, they're small firms, like you said. And this is where I believe, and this is why I got involved with, with Jason's work at, at, and the Mental Health Charter. This is where that collaborative effort is so important. You know, from a from a basis of being able to pool resources under one overarching umbrella, where all of these uh, SMEs, for for want of a better description, you know, they can tap into that knowledge, tap into that that shared resource, um, and and share good and best practice one with another, so that they develop together. Very different for for the large corporates like Sam, and that this is not to denigrate, you know, the 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 work that you do, but you have the financial resource to um, loss lead on a venture like this, whereas a lot of smaller organisations don't. So get together, pool resources, share best practice, and get it all under one umbrella, so that everyone knows where it is and how to get to it, and that actually can serve as a real benefit because you know because it's under a separate umbrella it's disconnected from your your organization so that can confound the the fear around confidentiality and, and you know having to share with certain people in your group who might not be aligned in your understanding of adverse mental health and stress and um, you know that it's removed from your work environment and that's where you're seeking and accessing support sam I couldn't I couldn't agree more. I also think this is a space that um companies like TSB can do more. Mm -hmm. Um and to be candid, that that's something that we need to be better at going forward. We do have a wealth of resources, we've got a wealth of experience within our company, um, and trying to reach people who can benefit from that experience, you know, in a network, one-to-one -one conversations, picking up the phone, that's that is where we can do better. Yeah, no, and, and Amy's asked a, a very similar question about, you know, I asked, should the corporates, that wasn't aimed at just uh, lenders, you know, should networks be playing a bigger part, service providers like ourselves? I think, I think yes, is the honest answer. I think we can all do better. I think we've all started to very much look after our own staff and, and do a lot of things for our staff. And I think as Clark says, it's now we should start looking outside more of our organisations and, and sort of saying, how, how can we pass that on to other people? How can we check? And, you know, I think lockdown did a lot of that. We did a lot of work where you just ring uh, advisors and firms and go, how's it going? What's happening? And and has that dropped off a lot more now? Probably yes. Has everybody got busy and, you know, you get back to normality? So I, I, I think you're right, Amy. I think we can all do do better in that chain um, and, and getting that information out. And I think, yeah, having it in a central place could, could help. And I, I suppose... Clark, can we learn anything from anywhere else? And, you know, I pick up, obviously, you're from the football world and, and you know, Norwich City did a great advert last year where they did it as the opposite person that you expected to, to have the problem. And then Wolverhampton Wanderers did that that poignant video of, you know, outside the ground, if you want to hug, come and hug me. And, and you know, afterwards they put a note up that they actually intervened in about five people and gave them the help that, that they needed because they were watching what was happening. And, can we learn from that? Can we learn from other areas? Definitely can. And just to go back one step, you know, the the if you work in in a large organization to to pool your resources and share with others, especially the smaller ones in this sector, it's a win win because no corporate is an island in in this industry. So if you're actually utilizing your resources to underpin the wellness of everyone in your chain. That's going to make your proffering and your daily work uh, workload far, far easier. You know that all problems are work related and not due to any kind of, you know, uh, unwellness or, or stress load in those in your chain. But when it when it comes to learning from others, you know, the, the two campaigns that, that you've just mentioned there, they're, they're excellent examples of showcasing services. You know, and what Carrie and I, my wife, have found in, in all of our work, which has crossed every sector over the past eight years, 
is that there's a huge disparity between the services that are offered and the actual uptake of those services. And that disparity is usually due to visibility. And, you know, there, there are so many colleagues who don't know what is on offer within their organization. So if you do have campaigns like the ones you've mentioned, you can bring those services to your colleagues and employees' attention, and hopefully that will drive an uptake. But it's not just about learning from what's good in other organizations. It's also about learning from what doesn't work in other organizations. And another recurring theme that we've found is because the we have to be honest in this conversation, the whole mental health and well-being drive, it's really nascent. You know, people, people have, have jumped on it over the past 10, 10 years, let's say, with a huge spike post-pandemic. And what that meant was that a lot of people threw everything at their employees. And when you throw everything at your employees in the context of resources, people get swamped. And at times of crisis or in need, they don't know where to go because there are 110 different things on offer. So what we need to learn from that is that generic approaches have limited or no success. So uh, when it comes to well-being, we can't retrofit a broken system. It, it's of fundamental importance that we know the needs and wants of our colleagues and employees that specifically pertain to our sector. Mm -hmm. And when we have that data, that's when we can start to construct a support system that's not only fit for purpose, but it's also commensurate with the need. Mm -hmm. So, yes, we can learn about the good things, but it's really important that we learn from what doesn't work in other areas. And we're, we're just starting to have these conversations here, especially in the, you know, the specialist finance space. It's a perfect opportunity because we're not retrofitting. Mm -hmm. So we can find out, we can construct, we can deliver what's fit for purpose. And I think for me, if you take that to the next step is there's a quest, couple of questions about provisions and uh, are your employers, you know, as, as are they doing enough? Are they helping? And that that's dipped a bit. And again, that could be because we've had a lot more new people do the survey compared to last year and, and maybe their businesses haven't gone. But I think sometimes it's, it, it's, as you said, how you package it and how you put it. So when, when we set this up with, with Jason and a few of the others, we look, well, can we sign this charter? And I was going, well, I'm not sure we can, but when I spoke to our HR and our facilities team, it's, yeah, we do all of that. But they're all individually labelled somewhere in the staff handbook that you have to go and find. It wasn't put together in an example like support in, if, if you're struggling with this, support if you're struggling with that. It, it, it wasn't easy to find. Yes, it was all there. And I do wonder, is there a better way that we as corporates and maybe Sankin out on that, how do you get that message and how do you keep that message there to your other point, Clark, is six months later, you might have forgotten where it is because when they announced it, you didn't need it. <laughs> this is so very true. And uh, my response to this is actually going to be on a, a, a professional liability angle. Right. It is literally 50 years, 50 years, since the Health and Safety at Work Act came into being, 50 years. In there, it says that personal injury is any disease or any impairment of a person's physical and mental ability. It's been in there for 50 years. So you go around any workplace, you'll see all the HSE posters uh, and you'll see all of your strategy and policy. You won't let anyone lift a box until they've done a training course. It's in the bone. Well, now the HSE is starting to get hot on your provision and are you following these guidelines for the mental health of your employees? So I, I would recommend that every organization has a little anal analysis on what they do for physical health and what they do for physical liability in the workplace. Because now when it comes to mental health and wellness, you have... It, not just an option, a responsibility to provide information, instruction, training and supervision with regards to your, your employees' mental health. 
So are you fulfilling that provision and does it match what you're doing for physical health? Mm -hmm. And and Sam, from your point of view, how, how do you signpost, I suppose, to, to your staff how they can find anything and how easy is it? And do you check it? That's yes. the question. Do you check that they can find things? We um we've put a lot of a lot of work and thought into what we call our channel strategy. Um, and that's how our colleagues access the services that we need when we need it. Our wellbeing strategy focuses on three pillars. So you have um, financial health, physical health, and mental health. Um, we have a wellbeing hub, which is hosted on our internal intranet, um, which is all fine and well. But what we do in the background is monitor when our colleagues click in into that wellbeing hub and what elements are they clicking on. And to mirror Clark's point, absolutely, we um, hands up, we're guilty of at one point in time, throwing our resources at colleagues. Um, but what we have is a user group. Now, there's varying uh, mechanisms within our own company where we capture colleague voice, but particularly a vested interest for myself um, is our TSB link forum, which is a cross section of colleagues, and also an HR user group, so a cross section of colleagues that really give us feedback on our tools and resources that we have an interest in. And what I do is I take both of those pieces of feedback plus the data and work out, are people getting it when they need it? And do we need to make any changes? Um, and it's also a really great temperature check on, well, how are our colleagues feeling? Um, has there been any uptake in the mental health wellbeing hub, for example? So you really do need to have a regular drumbeat of, of communication with all colleagues. So we do that regularly, but it's not just come and click into the mental health hub. It is, well, actually, how do we keep that content fresh and alive and attuned to how people are feeling? So Mental Health Awareness Week, or we'll run a webinar on um, healthy eating and healthy habits. And we'll host it on the hub and we'll try and drive traffic to it. And we'll also go along to local team meetings. Um, so you'll have an HR colleague that will come along and talk to our management teams around how can you help or spot colleagues who may be in mental health crisis? So it's really multifaceted. You have to make sure that you're talking to your colleagues. Are they getting what they want? Do they understand what's on offer? And actually what you have on offer, is it meeting the need? Um, otherwise, there is no point to your wellbeing strategy. You're not getting the help to the colleagues when you need it. Um, and one key lesson to take away for ourselves um, is not don't talk about um, the service by way of here, you know, you can call it your, your employee support line. That's pretty meaningless to our colleagues on the front line. What is it that is actually that service going to offer me? So be um, action driven. I am in crisis on this number. So being really sort of black mm -hmm. and white and what is the offering that is there. That's great. Good advice. And I think we focused a lot of some of the answers now are more on, on the, the, the mental aspects, but I suppose you've then got the physical well-being because mental challenges can then make you, you your diet can go all to part, which then all become. And that's probably a whole webinar on on, on the dietary side of it, to be honest, of, of how that can affect and, and manage your stress. But the one question we asked in there was about people's sleep patterns. It was really interesting that even for me, when it said the actual recommendation is nine hours sleep, I'm like, wow. You know, I probably can't remember that one personally, but it, it was interesting that 46% of, of, of the people who responded said that they had either two or less days in a week where they got the recommended sleep, which then, how, how do we help people? How do we help them switch off? Because that's the challenge, isn't it, as you say? And, you know, it's not just work, it's then the home life of what do they have to do their hair. Any tips on switching off? I'll start with you, Sam, as you're on my screen. Um, so I'm probably not the one to, I've got two very small kids, so I equally don't, don't get enough sleep. <laughs> <laughs> um, but there's, there's sort of, there are some quick wins in helping people switch off. Use technology, switch off notifications, and um, practice mindfulness when you close that laptop. So take the time. Have a physical um, habit where you switch from work to personal life also helps. It's more difficult in a hybrid working environment. If you're in the office, then you're on the bus, you can listen to a podcast. But we recommend close your laptop, go for a 10 minute walk or have a five minute podcast or um, on Spotify for um, mindfulness meditation. Do something that is your transition from work to personal life can help. 
Um, and also all of the best practice in sleep where, you know, um, dimming the lights in your room as you go, have a, have a routine for going to bed. Now that might sound a little bit like teaching your granny to suck eggs. However, it does work. You know, don't be sitting up late on your phone. And these are the mantras that we have internally. So dim the lights, have healthy habits, have a transition from work to personal life and, and try and make the space for it. It doesn't have to be lengthy or timely, but it can really meaningfully help you switch off from work. Clark, how, how do you switch off? Oh, uh, I listen to um, Classic FM, 10 o'clock till 10.30 is my time. And I listen to Relaxing Classics with Marguerite Taylor. Actually, she's just been shifted to daytime. And I, I sit uh, usually in the dark and I smoke a pipe. Um, not a crack pipe, just, you know, just a little bit of cherry tobacco or something like that. But that is my half hour decompression. Uh, and, you know, I, I'll reiterate everything that Sam said there because... What we have to accept is that the demands of this sector may mean that you can't get nine hours of sleep every night. So when then you switch your attention to the quality of that sleep and trying to address the quality of your sleep means a transition period from on to off. And that can come in the form of any routine that works for you uh, as long as you're cognizant of it and mm -hmm. you're deliberate about it. And when it becomes your routine, you'll find that you sleep quicker and you sleep deeper. Uh, and that's the thing that we can address in this scenario. Excellent. I think we'll sort of close it off around now. I think, you know, we, we'll put the, we'll, Amy can put something up about where people can download the report if they want more. But start with you, Clark. Is there anything else that you'd say as a final comment that we should all be thinking about? Um, well, do you know what I love about this report is the actual um, open text contributions that people mm -hmm. are able to give, you know, and that gives you a more qualitative understanding uh, of where people are at. And there are three positives and three negatives that were occurring in, in that open text box. And um, the positives were what repeatedly came out. Um, in the hybrid environment uh, or working from home, people have more time with partner uh, partners and kids more time with their dog was a repeated response so you know when we say family let's not just you know uh, pigeonhole that as a, a traditional concept of what family is it's different for everyone but the the big one was I I'm now in an in an organization with a great environment a great culture and uh, healthcare support so when people are cognizant of it whether they utilize it or not is irrelevant if they know it's there it makes them feel better the negatives standard workloads too great no pay rise yet my company is still expecting more from me so expecting more for less and we're in a toxic culture culture features heavily both positively mm -hmm. and negatively so it should be a focus point for what we're doing as organizations thank you and, and sam the final word from you Make your own well-being your priority. You only get one life and every day you're spending it, that, that moment's gone. So seize the moment, check in with yourself, how are you feeling and recalibrate and take control of what you can take control of and have open, safe space conversations. That's, that's for me is getting the basics right. Excellent. Thank you for that. And Amy's just dropped in the chat the, the link to the report, if anybody there. So thank you for that, Amy. I think it'd be remiss of me uh, as a as a signature to not say that go visit our website. Go on there. It's www.mimhc.co.uk. You can see the resources are there. There's a button there if you want to be a signatory as a firm. So if you are, brilliant. Thank you very much. Go and utilise it. If you're not, have a look about how you can sign up. Uh, it's all about trying to help all of us in the industry uh, lead a happy and healthier life. So I'd like to thank everybody uh, who's come on today. I'd like to thank Sam and Clark for taking their time out and giving some great feedback. And I'll pass you back to Amy now to close. Thank you all. Thank you so much, Sam, Clark, Martin. It was a really interesting discussion. I think something that's well overdue for the industry, for this kind of conversations to be taking place more openly. Like Martin said, I have popped the link to the report in the chat. So please 
do go and have a look at that. It's a really interesting read and the website as a whole, like I say, you should look at the charter, take it to the people in your business who, you know, might be interested in joining the charter. Please do sign up because it's really interesting. I'll also put a link to the website in your post event email as well. So you can check it out there. Um, and this session will be available on Financial Reporter soon so that you can share it with anyone who would like to share it with. 